Charna davis Weesey, and welcome to UCF Profiles. Now, next time you complain about a few weeds in your garden or a crabgrass on your lawn, think of our next guest, and your job will seem minuscule in comparison. Please welcome Dr. Martin Quigley. He is the director of the UCF Arboretum, and he's in charge of all the landscaping on the campus. And my new best friend, we've been having so much fun talking, and I am totally garden impaired gardening impaired, I look at something and it dies, which really is bad coming married to a family of <laughs> garden fanatics. And farmers. And farmers. So mm. you, you, you have the same background. Is it in the mm. blood with the farming background that no, is actually, with my in-laws? I don't have much of a farming background. I grew up working for a uh, landscape and nursery business, so I learned it from somebody but else. But your grandparents did, right? Well, yeah, my grandparents. Well, you know, if you look at most Americans three generations back, 92% of Americans were farmers. And so that informs a lot of the way we look at our landscape. We want things tidy, we want them orderly, we want straight lines, we don't want things to touch. And so if you look around Central Florida, people have brought a very Midwestern and Northeastern idea to the Florida landscape, and it doesn't really fit here. And so they're battling nature, and that's what I find so ironic. Florida has so many possibilities for the real gardener, and even for the weekend warrior, or even for the people who just hire out to contractors, and yet we drive around the most boring, boring landscapes, even in very expensive neighborhoods, and I think, why don't they have color? They don't know. Why don't they have fruit? They don't know. They don't know about it. Like when my mother-in-law comes from the Midwest, and, and they're from a farming community, mm. farmers, like you say, and we'll drive around, and she'll say, what's that tree called? I don't know. <laughs> What's that? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. And then we struggle with things because we go to the, the home store or the local right. home store. We try to buy stuff and we put it in the ground and work really hard and it goes meow. <laughs> well, the problem with the big box stores, they're getting plants from California, Arizona, Georgia, Texas, and wherever. They have huge lots. They're not selling things that are adapted to Central Florida necessarily. Everybody assumes since they're for sale here, they'll grow here, but they're selling tropical palms that will, will not grow north of Miami, or they're selling hardwood trees that will not grow south of Jacksonville or Tallahassee. And here we are innocently buying all this material and thinking, oh, that looks pretty. They probably have the same stock that they're selling up in oh, the Northeast. Absolutely. absolutely. And so unlike any other consumer item, plants are the most abused because they're regional. Now you can buy a sweater here and you Florida, you'll wear it five days a year, and in New York, you'll wear it, wear it for months, but you know what is appropriate for that sweater. Here, people have no idea where plants came from. You know, we have a big thing about native plants now, but native to what? There are no plants native to a parking lot, so why would you need all Florida natives if you're doing a parking lot? What I'm trying to do is to educate at the local and community level, and then through the university, that the right plant in the right place may be a native, or it may be an introduced plant. The big problem for Florida was that so many plants were brought here from all around the world for food or for horticulture, for decoration, for ornament, and so many of them have taken off into the natural systems and become invasive. Oh, that's kudzu. Yeah. You go through the Carolinas and it's, it's pathetic. And it's very sad. And we don't have kudzu here because we don't have enough of a winter, like in Japan where it came from. What we have is the air potato which is the kudzu of Central Florida. And what's that? It's a, it's a beautiful heart-shaped leaf. Oh, I know. And it I makes know. those potatoes, and every one of those potatoes will make 15 new plants. Is and that what that is, climbing it, up my pine that's trees? That's right, and it will grow almost as fast as kudzu, and it spreads faster than kudzu because every one of those little bulbs, whether it falls to the ground and rolls or if squirrels carry it off, every one of those will make a new plant. So we have incredible problems of invasive species that were innocently introduced as a garden plant. Brazilian pepper, if you drive from, actually drive from Orlando to Miami, all the freeways are lined with Brazilian pepper. Well, that was a cute little street tree that came from South America, and it was beautiful. Red berries, nice glossy green foliage. Nobody had any idea that it was going to take over the universe. So, it's like Audrey in Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah, <laughs> just one person at a time. <laughs> so we have so many things to worry about here. First of all, understanding that you know a lot of our population, even though you know our kids may be growing up in Florida, most of our adult population doesn't come from Florida originally. We come from all over the country carrying with us other ideas from other climates. Florida is unique in the Western Hemisphere. Florida has a monsoon climate, which means we have our cool weather when it's dry. 
So we have cool, dry winters, which is when people come. I mean, that's what makes Florida so attractive. That's why people came here. Um, it was not too cold, but it was beautiful. But then we have our wet season when it's hot, and that's when everything rots. There is no other climate zone like that in North and South America. People try to do Mediterranean plants, oreganos and figs and all those things because we have the same temperature regime as the Mediterranean. It's coolish in the winter and very hot in the summer. So the big difference is in Mediterranean climates like California or the Mediterranean or South America or South Africa or Australia, in real Mediterranean climates, the winter has the moisture and so it's hot and dry. And so we have this very, very challenging problem that we're dry when it's cool and we're wet when it's hot. And that kills more plants than anything because they have all their sprinkler systems set for every two days, regardless of what the weather is, right through the hurricane season, sprink sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle their lawns, and they're just rotting their plants off. So the healthiest plant is going, help me, help me. <laughs> they're just drowning. I'm so <laughs> depressed, Martin. What, so what, what do we do? <laughs> what, How do we know they have the little tiny Florida-friendly section in the big box stores? Florida-friendly, schmendly. <laughs> you know, again, you know, what's your situation? What does the plant want? If it needs drainage, you can build it up. You can add a few nutrients. One of the big enemies of Central Florida gardening is the idea that the lawn should be the general default ground cover. There is no lawn grass, no turf grass that is adapted to Central Florida. And so the big contenders, Augustine among the worst, um, are, are really like terminal patients on the edge of death. <laughs> They require constant inputs of fertilizer, pesticide, lots of money, irrigation, lots of money. Most people just turn it over to a lawn service, but they don't realize that we are facing a water crisis. And estimates put it somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of all potable water in Florida goes straight into the lawn. It's and for what? For St. Augustine, that hurts your feet when you walk on it. Nobody likes it. It's just kind of a, a look in the distance. So we need to rethink what we do with our personal landscape. My, my educational shtick is to tell people, look, we all believe in the environment. We know we need trees. We know we need you know, diversity. Why don't we apply those values to the places where we live? We think of our home gardens as something separate from the environment. What I'm trying to do with the university is to show that even the constructed landscape can connect to the environment in a meaningful way a butterfly corridor, a wildlife corridor, and Florida offers more opportunity for more fun things. I got in trouble when I interviewed here, actually. I, I looked out the window from the conference room and I said, this campus looks like New Jersey with a couple of palm trees. You know, <laughs> they gave me the job anyway, but... Because they wanted you to change it. Well, that's it. And I thought, well, where are the orange trees? Where's the color? You know? they, they were torn down for developments. <laughs> exactly. but. In our <laughs> gardens, you look at so many subdivisions, you know, upper end houses that have concrete edging. They're industrial landscapes. They have evergreen foundation plantings and these huge lawns and then a pot of flowers at the front door and they call it a day. But where's the edibles? You know, I eat something out of my garden every single day of the year. We were really into, I shouldn't say we, because as I said, I look at something neat, but my husband was really into his garden. He, he planted cucumbers and mm -hmm. they kind of were the kudzu of our house. Mm -hmm. So we had five million cucumbers and a thousand gaz uh, like gazillion zucchinis. zucchinis. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it invited the critters. We had Wild Kingdom buffet. That, that <laughs> is the problem. There are some things, once the critters know they're there, you're, you're lost. But the problem there is your husband comes from the Midwest, he puts in this orderly garden in he rows, does. and it is a buffet. Those, but what I do is I integrate my edibles with my ornamentals, and so they're isolated, they're harder to find, the animals don't glom onto them. So I have tomato plants here and basil plants there as part of my border, and it's not like a little truck garden carved out of the backyard. My fruit trees are my shade trees, I have mango and Papaya. The mango doesn't freeze here? Yeah, it will in a bad winter, but once it gets big enough, it will recover. My That's sister has mango in South Florida. Yeah. It's wonderful. Well, there you do, but Orlando, we're pushing it. But, you know, we are having global climate change, and our winters are getting less severe. Now, I've been nipped a few times, but I've got a few plants. And that's the thing about gardening in Florida, and any gardener. Gardeners are compulsive, obsessive people and they really are always killing plants. You can't garden without, you know, pushing the envelope, which means some death will occur. 
Luckily, it's not like killing your cat or your dog. But <laughs> most people are afraid to experiment with their plants. That's another thing. You buy a plant, it's not doing well. Don't so put it in again. Just watch it die. Well, move it. If it's not doing well, what have you got to lose? You know what else I've noticed? Uh, I wish I knew the name of these stinky plants, but all of a sudden you'll see the purple hedges mm -hmm. in one house. Mm -hmm. And then they'll have those those other ones with the variegated leaves mm -hmm. that are kind of like small trees. Right. And one house will have it, and boom, every house in the neighborhood has the same thing. Well, that's the problem. Again, we plant in blocks, and this is where our, our American agricultural mentality comes in through, that we have to have blocks of one species. Now, I'm all about mixing. You My know, husband is, too. You know how the kids are. Don't let it touch. If the gravy touches the peas or the mashed potatoes, they go ballistic. Don't go outside the lines. Yeah, it's color inside the lines. And most people lay out their yards that way, or their yards are laid out by the developers. That's really it. Right. And even um, million-dollar houses in Orlando are laid out by very, um, I would say, inexpert garden designers who are doing the simplest possible thing to just cover the ground with turf and put in some shrubs. So where do we go and, and how do we know what to do? We just keep trying until we find something that doesn't die? Well, luckily, um, ecological landscaping is coming up. Um, there's more and more uh, information being offered through the Gainesville um, for the UF Extension Service. There's tons of stuff online. Really? You Google IFAS and it will bring you to um, the Extension Service out of Gainesville. I wish we had it at UCF, but UCF doesn't have horticulture or right. forestry. None of those things were to be duplicated when UCF started. Uh, but we do have master gardeners and we are getting to a point where there are now native plant nurseries in the Orlando area all over Florida. Some of them are mom and pop places, but some of them are actually at industrial commercial sizes, wetland plants, upland plants, and you really can do a native Florida garden. Now the problem with native Florida plants is they may not bloom all year long like a marigold or a petunia that we're used to. So you have to adjust your mindset as to what you expect. Or, or pick some that bloom one season next and to mix, some that and bloom another And that's why one. you have to mix. But again, because of our developer mentality when it comes to our, our landscapes, we expect things to stay the same, like furniture, right? The, carp, the curtains, the carpet, we don't expect those to change. Or go Unless you dormant. have three kids like we do. Yeah, well, <laughs> then there's that, the maintenance issue. The other problem, of course, is maintenance. And right. here's something that no matter what you do outside, it takes maintenance, the same as pets and children. You can't put them in the closet for a month and then take them out and feed them and put them back in. Living things require maintenance. So you need to set your willingness to work in it or to hire out the work and then work within that. Now, when I move into a house, I rip out all the front lawn and put in shrubs and flowers. The no neighbor. lawn at all? No. Well, then I have to put it back in because the neighbor's right to the Homes Association. <laughs> but I only put in a little piece. That is your cue to care. If you have some manicured lawn, it shows that you're not just a, a hippie ne'er-do-well and that you really do care. And then when the flowers come up around it, people see that it's really beautiful. But you have to choose your level of commitment. People assume because I have very little lawn and a lot more flowers that I'm doing more work. Nothing could be further from the truth. Here in Central Florida, people are mowing 44 times a year on average. You know, once a week for 44 weeks, or more often. I have a neighbor who mows three times a week and edges three times a week because he loves his power tools. But that's a different story. <laughs> but my point is, I do three heavy weeding weekends in a year, and I spend a fraction of the time on a fabulous, lush landscape than these people do with their boring lawn and foundation plantings, and they don't want to do the math. Because to them, the machine makes more sense than right. some hands and knees work. Well, we're going to pick your brain a little bit more, right. but we have to take a break, and we'll be right back.
We're back. We're talking with Dr. Martin Quigley. He is the, the director of the UCF Arboretum, and he's in charge of all the landscaping. What mostly we've been talking about is what you and I can do to make our lawns look a lot better. Now, you say that you have all these beautiful lush flower, flowering things. Mm -hmm. What are they? <laughs> what are they? I have variegated. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I have variegated Chef Lara. Actually, what I have is banked up, not quite the wedding cake motif, it's a little looser, but I have a very tiny area of lawn to keep the neighbors happy. Behind that, I have a mixed thing of coleus and impatiens, which is rich in color. It's oranges and pinks and purples, which you wouldn't think would go well together. Oh, no, I but love that. But behind that, I have variegated chef Lara, and behind that, I have heliconia. So I have four layers of color. Heliconia. heliconia which, which one is that? Is those the dark, dark red ones? No, the hel they look like parrot beaks. Oh. And there are four different species that do really well. And then behind that, I go back down again. So instead of packing the front door with tall stuff, as most people do, I have my tall stuff in the middle, and then it goes back into a carpet of mixed color around the front door, so you don't feel hemmed in. You know, most people are giving their landscapes to the neighbors, and you see this whether you're in Maine or Montana or Miami. People have the idea that you put things along the driveway, the fence line, and against the house, and what you're doing there is creating a postcard for the neighbors to see, but nothing for you to see. If you look at European gardening, they enclose their space. They can actually go out and sunbathe topless or do anything they want in their garden because they haven't given it to the neighborhood. But we're Puritans. American was started by Puritans. Fences and hedges were actually prohibited because they wanted to make sure nobody was having any fun there. <laughs> No sex is occurring here. Seriously. <laughs> In the garden. The, the idea of the American lawn started with the common greens of New England, and it was developed in the Midwest when turf grass and lawn mowers and railroads all came together to create suburbia in the 1840s. All of a sudden, it was possible to work in the city and live outside the city, and it was tied together by lawns. So lawns are burned into our mind. The problem is that lawns really came from England, where it rains almost every day. And so here we are, no matter where we are in the U.S., we try to have this emerald green carpet. It started with the City Beautiful movements of the 1890s that it made you a better person. You were a better Christian. You were a better husband and householder. And so you had to have a velvet carpet. Those were the words then. Now, Scott's Turf, the biggest you know, lawn conglomerate in the country, has, has brought in a more militaristic thing. You're battling for your turf. <laughs> you know, all the pesticides have names like A-bomb or whatever. You know, it's and we are a competitive culture. It's like, it it's our, make war. yours better than your neighbors. But, right? but the problem is we see, we see our interaction interaction with plants and nature as a war, as a battle against nature. And what I'm trying to demonstrate with the gardens that I'm installing at UCF is that you work with nature, it reduces your work to almost nothing. You know, right. nature will do the work for you. You get plants that are compatible, you don't have to weed. What do we see? We see beds of mulch. Well, weeds love mulch just as much as anything else. The mulch else. disappears, it's gone. Mulch is, well, <laughs> I have a whole rant about that, but mulch is the underwear of the some, landscape. Some you don't communities, want to see mine. if you don't have mulch, yeah. the underwear of the landscape. It is the underwear. If you don't have it, you hear from the Homeowners Association, well, put out the mulch. Well, you need ground cover. And you know, mulch is good as a starter kit, but mulch dissolves or washes away, it becomes mm -hmm. topsoil. If your ground cover takes over, that's the clothing of the landscape. And it can be mixed ground cover. Oh my God. We can have one that blooms in the summer and one that blooms in the winter and they grow together. My husband just planted the ground cover. It was the one with the little teeny, I've told you I'm plant impaired. The little teeny, um, uh, very dark leaves. Mm -hmm. All of, It's all over Winter Park. Yeah. And so he did it the way the Midwesterns do. He's like, oh, they're each four feet apart mm -hmm. and it's taking forever. And it doesn't work. You've got to rip them apart. And people are afraid to do that. They buy ground cover at the... You rip them apart when they come out of the plastic That's thing. right. You rip them apart and plant them like rice. You know, it very... And really? They fill, they fill in. This is Florida. You know, we have a 10 or 11 or even 12 month growing season. That's the great thing here. You can make mistakes. Something dies. Who cares? Something See, we else think has we live in the swamp, but we really don't. No, we don't. They've drained the swamp. Even where wetlands once were, most of us are living in little miniature deserts. And so we're pouring the water on. There's so many ways to garden beautifully without, I don't have an irrigation system. I have the most colorful, the lushest, and even the grass I have is the greenest in the entire neighborhood. And I'm the only house in 102 that does not have an irrigation system. 
because wow. I, I do a little hand watering when it needs it and otherwise not. I remember we had impatience when we moved. We yeah. bought our house, uh, I guess, the like early 1990s, mm. and everybody had impatience, yeah. and they were gorgeous, yeah. and now nobody has them. Yeah. And I, I, I know when they got leggy, we ripped them out, but we probably should have replaced them. Oh, yeah. Twice a year. You do change outs. That's what your fun is. It was so much out. fun mixing up the colors, too. Plus, with the impatience, they ended up all the way over there. So well, and they, they see it themselves. <laughs> and then again, you go back to the problem. You know, what, what can you plant that's not native that won't take over? But, you know, there are native invaders, too. Grapevines. If you see woods, your wood edges, when people drive around Central Florida, they think that the woods are scary because it's draped with grapevines and, and underbrush that reaches up to the pines. You can't get through it. You have to remember that. 300 years ago, Florida looked like a park. It was open pine woodland with a few clumps of oak and a few clumps of palmetto, and otherwise it was knee-high grasses with flowers, the highest diversity in all of North America. What happened, though, with roads and agriculture is that they stopped the fires, and Florida is meant to burn. Florida gets more lightning strikes per square inch than any other place in the Western Hemisphere, and before white settlement, most of Florida burned on an average of every two to five years. Not all at once, but in little mosaics, low-level fires that went through the forest and kept the hardwoods from coming up under the pines. But with fire suppression, you know, Smokey says no forest fires, we've allowed all this fuel to build up, and so now the forest looks scary. You can't get through that palmetto. It's as high as your head. It'll cut you to shreds. The grapevines have knitted everything together, and the fuel loads have built up. Now when we get a lightning fire, and this That's happened... Really bad. Just before I came to UCF, there was a lightning fire, and the flames were 60 feet high and killed all the canopy because the fuel was so high. So at UCF, here's one of the things that we can do as communities, prescribed fire is essential. Look what just happened in California. And there were a few shots on the news of people saying, prescribed fire now. If you burn regularly, nature can keep its course, and you'll never have the kind of disaster I that you I worry about, you can see it if you drive... Um, um, like in the Delanda Berry area mm -hmm. off of I-4 mm -hmm. and some places um, where we live in, in Seminole County where the trees have, are down and dead mm -hmm. from the hurricanes and they're there, they're, they're waiting. I think yeah. they're waiting. It's, it's more fuel. Yeah. Well, in that Nobody's case, removed them, but they're in a place that... Well, they may rot too. I mean, this is Florida where things <laughs> do decompose. But, but pine needles and, and the duff builds up and it, be, it becomes just a layer of fuel waiting to be ignited. And that's a real problem. So what I'm trying to do is educate people that even though the biggest problem with, with public burning is smoke. It's not the danger of burning down houses because we do fire breaks. It's the smoke across roads, you know, like the big fires in the 90s. And so people have this idea that, that uh, fires are disasters. And of course, where woods have been neglected for years and years and years, it can be disastrous because the temperatures are so hot. But you've got to start somewhere. We've got to get back to regulating our, our natural spaces so that they function, our waterways, the, the, the green matrix. And that's something about Central Florida that is unique. You know, between our beautiful lakes and our remnant greenways, we can restore that to a healthy system even though we've done this leapfrogging development out into undeveloped lands. So I'm hoping that the university will become a demonstration of sustainability. And what's sustainability? It's wise use of today's resources to ensure that future generations have the same access to those resources. So we can't use them all up now. And by ignoring maintenance, well, it's, it's like owning anything. You don't own a car without having the oil checked. And you don't own you know, furniture without cleaning it once in a while. You can't manage forest by just putting a fence around it and say, okay, this is a forest preserve. Especially a dynamic landscape such as Florida, it requires fire, it requires now the removal of invasive species, and it's irresponsible to think we can just preserve land without maintaining it. And that's a public charge. So the big picture is think what is your own yard doing to connect to your neighborhood? What is your neighborhood doing to collect connect to the other green areas, whether they're parks or natural waterways. And how does that affect what ends up downstream? And as we know, we're having red tides. Well, what, what's the cause of red tide? It's water temperature for sure, but it's also all the nutrients that people are pouring on their lawns. They enter all the water systems. They end up in the estuaries and bays. And all of a sudden, we have incredible bloomings of red tide, which are a human health hazard, because we put too much chemicals on our lawns. How many people ever connect those dots? 
That's, that's part of my educational mission. The way to do it, though, is not to legislate, you must do this. People, and especially Americans, are very resistant when you come in and tell them, you must do this. You can't have that. So what I'm trying to do is the fabulous factor. You know, <laughs> people want to be one-ups on their neighbors. They want to be in part of a trend. If I can set a landscape motif or a way of thinking about it that looks incredibly fabulous, people will do it. And it can be fabulous and healthy. That's the thing. You know, you have the Botox landscape where everything has to be rigid <laughs> and not change. No, seriously. It's like never smiling. The Botox landscape is year-round. It looks exactly alike. And thanks to power tools, nothing ever blooms because they're always cutting off the buds. But, you know, the natural landscape, it smiles, it frowns, it weeps. You know, you have to do a little repair once in a while. But it's a living organism, and it becomes stronger with age whereas the Botox landscape just quietly desiccates behind its facade until it all has to be ripped out again. So what we need to do is get on the internet, go for the IFAS. Yep, and look and for plants for your situation. There's so much free information out there and so many people willing to help you choose the right plant for the right thing. There's the county extension service. They'll give you soil tests. If you have pests on your trees, they'll tell you how to treat them without you know, bringing in World War III. That they really are there to help you. It's our state tax money is supporting a great deal of plant research and horticulture. Now, they don't have the best designers, I have to say. Uh, I'm going to be shot for saying that, but they're horticulturists. Remember that plant lovers are not necessarily, you know, designers. You know, like art lovers are not necessarily artists. Right. They're, they're different skill sets. It's great when you get them together, but uh, that doesn't always have to ha happen. What you need is a sense of design which can come from one source and then the right plants. And it will work. Okay, let's hope. Let's hope. I'm gonna, I've got my, my, uh, my Heliconia and my IFAS website. I'm ready to go. All but right. then again, I'll just let my husband do it so it doesn't die. <laughs> Dr. Martin service. Quigley, thank you so much. Will you come back again so we yes, can talk about actually will. the landscape on the university? Which means I Actually, and I do want to talk, to, uh, talk about the landscape on the university because we're trying something that has never been tried before burning in the urban fabric and restoring a landscape as construction goes on. And we will have Dr. Quickly back because we have way more to talk about. Maybe a right. three hour show. Maybe. Thank you for watching. <laughs> we'll see you again next time. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. <laughs>